Coming to you today from Yenevan, Armenia. Returned from Artsakh yesterday, where I was with my family on a, a tour of, uh, of uh, Artsakh. Uh, had a wonderful uh, time there. Uh, arrived in Yenevan just in time uh, to read about this news of a, a new plan put forward by uh, the Department of State regarding Artsakh's future status and security. Uh, that is uh, ultimately uh, really nothing new at all. It is a recycled, um, uh, very lightly rewritten version of the Madrid Principles, uh, a deeply flawed, manifestly failed uh, set of ideas for resolving uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh issue. Um, thank you for tuning in. I know that it's very early uh, back in the U.S. and uh, um, uh, we have a lot of viewers here uh, in, in Armenia, but I know that some of you will catch up with this a little bit later uh, in the U.S., in North America, in the, in the Western Hemisphere. For those of you who just want to sort of get the short of it, let me give you a, a quick short version and then I'll do a deeper dive for those of you who'd like to stay tuned uh, a little bit longer. The short of it is um, that this is a fool's deal. This is uh, a recycled Madrid plan. Uh, check out the ENC Facebook page. There's a, there's a short video, a couple minutes long, that, that gives you a, a thorough grounding in, in, this, in, this, in this very dangerous plan that's been put forward for the Armenians. Uh, what are the Madrid principles? Basically, it's this that the Armenian side, Artsakh and Armenia, uh, make an upfront, strategic, and irrevocable set of concessions, a uh, surrender of sovereignty and security, in return for Ilham Aliyev's promise that at some point in the future, at some later date, um, undetermined, there will be some sort of expression of will, undefined, uh, determined by some constituency, which has never been uh, explained, regarding the future status of of Artsakh. So on the one hand, you have these very concrete, very uh, serious concessions that the Armenian would make, Armenians would make on day one of this Madrid plan. And then on, in return, you have this sort of vague promises that, that uh, Aliyev or some future Azerbaijani leader is supposed to make uh, on the, the status of, uh, uh, of Artsakh and the security of Artsakh as well. I think there's not a third grade uh, child in Armenia or in any of our Armenian schools or public schools around the world who wouldn't understand that this is a highly asymmetrical, uh, ridiculous proposal. It is. Uh, it would require that the Armenians suspend uh, their sense of self-preservation, their sense of logic, their uh, ability to uh, reason uh, regarding uh, the future of their uh, uh, of their nation. It, it, it is beyond. Um, it is simply outside the realm of reason, and I don't think that uh, it's been thought through, and I think that it's a, it's a deeply flawed plan that gets pitched over and over and over again, and uh, the, the OSCE deserves better, the, the Armenian people deserve better, even the Azerbaijani people deserve better than to recycle this old, flawed plan. Uh, this approach uh, is a disservice uh, to U.S. values, which are you know deeply devoted to the idea of democracy and self-determination. We are... Um, uh, as Americans, uh, a nation born of an independent struggle. The idea uh, of Artsakh is very much the story of a free people and, and their victory over foreign rule. So it's a disservice to American values. It's also a disservice to U.S. interests, which uh, are heavily invested in a durable and democratic peace in that part of the world. Uh, we do not want to see perpetual conflict. Americans don't want to see uh, instability in that part of the world for a variety of reasons. So this plan sets back the cause of a durable and democratic peace. And at a, at a more micro level, at a more uh, detailed level, uh, this is a disservice to uh, the new OSC Minsk Group Chairman, uh, Andrew Schofer, who was just recently appointed. In fact, in the last 24 hours or so, his appointment was announced in Washington, D.C. What a terrible disservice to this diplomat that he is handicapped on the, on the very first days and weeks of his tenure with uh, uh, this terrible plan. It's a burden that it will be very hard to overcome. In fact, one that he will need to, uh, to distance himself from, to repudiate, to push away from, and to pivot toward a real peace plan that talks about peace and security in, in, in terms that matter and in terms that make sense. So that's the short of it, that this is a reckless plan as I said, there's not a third grade Armenian kid uh, in a school um, uh, anywhere in the world who wouldn't see the, the foolish nature and the reckless uh, uh, prospects of such an accord. So this is, this is a bad deal. That's the short of it. It's a bad deal. Uh, I can't imagine that any of the diplomats pushing this deal would uh, accept the terms for themselves. How many of them would hand over, uh, for example, the deed to their house, the title to their home, uh, in return for a promise from a proven liar, a, a sworn enemy, 
to at some point in the future uh, discuss the, 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 the price uh, that they'll be paid in return. Who would do that? The, 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 these folks who pitch these ideas do so with a straight face, but uh, obviously uh, in a shameless way because they would never accept the terms that they're proposing for others for themselves. They would never do that. They, they're not foolish enough. Uh, two minutes uh, with a, a third grader in their own family would teach them that that's a fool's, uh, a fool's errand and they wouldn't, they wouldn't accept it for themselves. Why would they expect it of the people of Artsakh? Why would they expect it of the people of Armenia? And why would they expect it of the people of the diaspora? So that's the short of it. Uh, the, the, the longer deep dive, and I think we do need to look at these things very seriously and, and, and dig deep and, and look at the facts because these uh, are not simply things that we can gloss over. We need to, to study them. And in, in this case, we have... Um, a set of six ideas. Again, they're recycled, but they're six ideas, and they've been put on paper. Uh, they were distributed uh, in Washington, D.C. at an event um, uh, by the Department of State, by the outgoing OSC Minsk Group uh, co-chairman, uh, Richard Hoagland. Uh, as I said, he's been replaced now with, with Andrew Schofer. Uh, uh, Ambassador Hoagland handed out this paper. It didn't have State Department letterhead on it. I'm not sure exactly why. Uh, perhaps they themselves know that it's, it's, it's uh, not worthy of their letterhead. Uh, but it was handed out on a piece of white paper, and people are, you know, supposed to uh, consider it and accept it. And, and then, you know, what we should do? We should study it, and we should give it a, a reasoned response, one that is informed by our history and our interests and our desire for, as I said, a durable and democratic peace. So let's start here at the at the six points on this piece of paper, white paper, no letterhead. Let's look at the six points here. It says here, I'll read each point one by one. In light of Nagorno-Karabakh's complex history. The side should commit to determining its final legal status through mutually agreed and legally binding expression, through a mutually agreed and legally binding expression of will in the future. Interim status will be temporary. Okay, let's break that down. Is Artsakh's history really that complex? It is an Armenian history. It is. I, I spent, you know, uh, I was just with uh, with the family. My, my my son and daughter are making their first trip to Artsakh. My wife, Anna Nazan, uh, and I, um, you know, returning to Artsakh, uh, which we love. And you know, we spent uh, our time going from Khachkat to Khachkar, from Vank to Vank, and in, at every step on that sacred soil, uh, we saw the, the testament to centuries, to millennia of uh, uh, Armenian. Uh, culture and life and love on that land. It is Armenian land as surely as Yerevan or any other part of the Armenian um, homeland. So the history is not that complex, number one. Number two, uh, the phrase here, the side should commit to determining its final legal status through a mutually agreed and legally binding expression of will. Many weaknesses in that one sentence. Let's first start to mutually agreed upon. Mutually agreed upon. So what that really means, and this is very crucial for you to understand, what that really means is Azerbaijan gets a veto. That, that the citizens of Artsakh can have democracy, can choose their own government, can live in a society uh, with, um, by offering consent to those who govern them, only to the extent that Ilham Aliyev gives them that permission. Immensely arrogant proposition. An immensely arrogant proposition that the judge, that the arbiter of Artsakh's freedom, the right of these citizens, just like me, as an American, as right, my right as an American, I would never cede uh, to another to determine. We're, uh, the people of Artsakh are being asked to say, um, you, are, you can be free to the extent that Ilham Aliyev says you can be free. So that's, I mean, just morally, that takes us out of the ballpark. Then it says here, a legally binding expression of will. Uh, that is a remarkably vague um, uh, uh, wording. What is an expression of will? They don't even use the word referendum. Apparently, Azerbaijan will not permit the use of the word referendum, which in itself is questionable because there are issues of, well, what is the question of the referendum? Is the question about uh, degrees of autonomy? Is the question about uh, status within Azerbaijan? Is it about the reunification with Armenia? Is it about the uh, you know, independent status? Will, uh, uh, as a result of that referendum, or expression of will, not even called referendum, uh, will that result in Azerbaijan committing to a recognition of Artsakh. None of that is clarified, nor is the date of, of that expression of will. It could be uh, one day, one week, one year, one century. Aliyev was asked once, when might that be? And his answer in kind of a, a wise guy uh, manner was, well, perhaps in 100 years. So we're not expected to uh, accept those terms. Again, it's not a third grader in the Armenian world who would, who, who would accept that. And then it, it says here, 
that interim status will be temporary. What is interim status? Uh, do you think um, that uh, the American uh, founding fathers, those who uh, brought forth liberty uh, for uh, the 13 colonies, would have accepted a, uh, a declaration of interim status from, uh, from Great Britain, that they would have let the, the English be the arbiter of how much freedom they should have? No, they, did, they didn't go to England and say, well, you tell us if we can be free. Give us permission to be free. And uh, at some point when you're ready to do that, then we'll be free. Until then, we'll just you know, not be free. Uh, because you don't want us to. And that, uh, that interim status uh, is, w nobody would accept that for themselves. Uh, free nations uh, deserve their liberty. Uh, Artsakh has, at, at great cost, uh, fought for its freedom, uh, defended its people, uh, spent now a quarter of a century building a free and democratic society, and having uh, established independence, having, having uh, developed uh, a democratic and, and uh, open and po tolerant and pluralist society, Having done all this, they now, of their own accord, are going to take their independence and reduce it down to something. I can't even tell you where, but it's called interim status, and I'll tell you this, it's well below independence. So having achieved independence, the citizens of Artsakh are being asked to surrender that independence and now accept something that no one uh, uh, can define, this idea of interim status. Ask yourself again, uh, would the uh, American founders have accepted or even considered for a moment a declaration of interim status instead of a declaration of independence. Uh, when you think of it in those terms, it becomes very clear. The, the, the arrogance of this first point um, is uh, it's beyond words. I hope that I have been able to express it, but uh, this idea that others should determine uh, when and if Artsakh can be free, and in fact, the final arbiter of it will be Ilham Aliyev or one of his uh, successors, uh, is, uh, it's, it's wrong on so many levels. I hope that I've been able to, to convey that. Uh, second, the areas within the boundaries of the former Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Region that is not controlled by, by Baku should be granted an interim status that, at minimum, provides guarantees for security and self-governance. That really is offering nothing at all. The, the, uh, the formula for Artsakh under the Soviet Union was autonomy, but we know what that visited upon Artsakh. Uh, discrimination, um, economic oppression, Violence. Ultimately, when this, the moment Azerbaijan uh, was uh, uh, unconstrained by Soviet power in the region, uh, even as that process was unfolding, uh, 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 that autonomy or that uh, security or that self-governance uh, amounted to, to little more than outright aggression directed at the citizens of Artsakh, uh, meant to kill them and drive them from their homes, ultimately to erase even their memory on their homeland. So this, uh, this idea that uh, we should uh, return to the, the, the status quo ante, that to, to return to the, the place where we were under uh, the Soviets, number one, and number two, basically the promises that, uh, that Ilham Aliyev is making, which is, you know, uh, when I'm not busy bombing you, when I'm not busy killing uh, your citizens and soldiers, I am preparing to welcome you back into, uh, into our heart and home and to welcome you as uh, citizens of Azerbaijan. The, 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 the dissonance between those two ideas is, again, uh, of an epic, epic scale. On the one hand, Azerbaijan is saying, come home, my children, where you will have um, autonomy and self-governance and the ability to determine your destiny. Uh, essentially, in the same way that you used to, uh, right before uh, my government attacked you, and uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, relentlessly attacking uh, Artsakh. Uh, so the idea that uh, on this point, on the second point, that Artsakh would return to the situation they were in prior to Azerbaijan's aggression, prior to Artsakh's successful self-defense against that aggression, is 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 foolish uh, in the extreme. It's foolish in the extreme. Which brings us to uh, point number three. I'll read it again, because these words, if, if, if I paraphrase them, I don't think that you would believe that they, uh, somebody could utter them um, uh, you know, in a serious manner. But here's exactly what they say. The occupied territories, okay, I'm gonna set that aside for a second, because these are not occupied territories. This is the sovereign soil of Artsakh, the sovereign soil of the Artsakh Republic. But it says here, the occupied territory surrounding the Nagorno Karabakh, surrounding Nagorno Karabakh, should be returned to Azerbaijani control. There can be no settlement without respect for Azerbaijan's sovereignty 
and the recognition that its sovereignty over these territories must be restored. Again, uh, this goes back to the, the heart of the deal. The idea that uh, the Armenian side must do something. The Armenian side must surrender these territories. Uh, there's no corresponding Azerbaijan must. You never hear the rest of that sentence. It's always about our, the Armenian side must or Artsakh must. And it's, the verb is usually something like surrender, cede, give up. Uh, the, the, you very rarely hear the sentence coming out of the Minsk Group or the State Department uh, along the lines of Azerbaijan must. For example, Azerbaijan must stop its aggression. Azerbaijan must lift its blockade. Azerbaijan must stop demonizing Armenians in the most uh, detestable manner. You never, you never hear that. Uh, this, again, stress on Azerbaijani sovereignty uh, is, a, is a misnomer. Uh, Artsakh has never been part uh, of a free Azerbaijan. The only uh, claim that uh, Azerbaijan has, that Azerbaijan can make, uh, to Artsakh is, uh, hinges upon Joseph Stalin's arbitrary decision uh, to uh, place Artsakh under Azerbaijani administration, uh, which was a cynical ploy, uh, one that the, the Western world and now all the world rejects the idea of foreign rule over a free people, the idea of Moscow governing uh, and essentially manipulating uh, um, uh, nations and peoples uh, for its own benefit. The world has rejected that. Uh, and it seems that the one outlier uh, on that score is Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan's false claim to sovereignty over Artsakh. So there are deep flaws in that. Point number three, this, it's Armenia, um, uh, the territories of Artsakh are the unified uh, elements of the Artsakh Republic. There's no such thing as occupied territories. That is a, a false, false uh, claim. It's, it's, a, it's a loaded term that's used to, to try to put the Armenians on the defensive. It obviously does not work. It's, it's a, you know, kind of a uh, clever, you know, kind of like a psychological game. You know, we don't buy it, of course. Um, and this notion of sovereignty is false. And the, 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 the recklessness of the Armenians uh, you know, dividing up Artsakh uh, in some, you know, Aliyev-imposed manner that will somehow lead Aliyev and his or his successors to being, uh, to expressing goodwill and good faith and, and um, you know, openness to peace with the Armenians. Is, I think anyone who's, who's followed Azerbaijan or Aliyev uh, for even a short time knows that that, again, is an absolute fantasy, an absolute fantasy. Again, one that the negotiators would never accept for themselves, but seem very eager to, you know, invite the Armenians to accept. Uh, which takes us to point number four. Oof, this is, I, I have a hard time reading this stuff, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it says here. There should be a corridor linking Armenia to nagorno karabakh It must be wide enough to provide secure passage, but it cannot encompass the whole of the La Lachin district. Okay, that's again here uh, a clever negotiating tactic where you simply uh, use words like uh, there should be and cannot encompass. These are phrases that are meant to box the Armenians in to somehow believing that these terms uh, are acceptable or even worth, worthy of serious consideration. Uh, there should be a corridor linking Armenia to Karabakh. Who the heck do these guys think they are? Of course Armenia and Karabakh are, are connected. They are integral parts of the Armenian homeland. And the idea that somebody is going to grant to the citizens of Artsakh a connection to the rest of Armenia is, is again, arrogant and foolish and reckless and to even to even utter that sentence without challenging its very premise is is wrong on, on 10 levels um, then we move here to um, wide enough to provide secure passage but it cannot encompass the whole of Lachin district Lachin district again part of the Armenian homeland um, wide enough to provide secure passage let me tell you uh, during the Artsakh war during Azerbaijan's aggression against Artsakh there was no target that uh, Azerbaijan um, saw on the Armenian side, civilian, military, um, religious, that they did not attack. Those targets were all in, um, in or considered legitimate by the leadership, the successive leaderships of uh, Azerbaijan during uh, their aggression against Armenia. That, that continues until this very day, including uh, sniper attacks, not just against soldiers, but against citizens. That includes atrocities committed in, in the April War of 2016, including uh, the execution of, of elderly citizens, uh, the mutilation of corpses, uh, th uh, terrible human rights abuses uh, took place. Everybody, uh, everybody within the reach of uh, Aliyev's arms uh, became victims of his aggression, or at least targets of his aggression. 
Does anyone think that if you were to narrow down the set of targets and, and for example, highlight, you know, in some fantasy world, that only the, a very narrow launching corridor connects uh, Armenia and Artsakh, do you think for a moment that's not target number one in, uh, in Aliyev's playbook? Of course it is. It, the, the, again, the, I have to be returning always to the word arrogance, the utter arrogance of others determining the level of freedom that should be accorded or enjoyed by the people of Artsakh. And number two, in the face of relentless Azerbaijani aggression, the idea that the Armenians would voluntarily uh, place themselves at 10 times greater risk in this foolish manner uh, is, is, again, out of the park, non-starter, you know, not going anywhere. A, a, a disservice uh, to the people of the region, a disservice to U.S. diplomacy, a disservice to U.S. diplomats. Uh, which brings us now to the number five, which is, it says here, an enduring settlement will have to recognize the right of all IDPs, that's uh, internally displaced persons, people who have been pushed out uh, of a conflict region uh, or fled a conflict region, but did not, uh, typically it means they didn't cross an international border. That itself is a little bit uh, undefined, a little vague, but it says here, an enduring, an enduring settlement will have to recognize the right of all IDPs and refugees, those who fled within borders and those who fled across borders, to return to their former places of residence. Uh, this is probably the, the least outwardly uh, uh, objectionable of the elements, uh, but in, to be properly understood, we would need to look at uh, this issue in, a, in, in its totality, in a comprehensive manner. If there's going to be a discussion of people returning home, uh, that should also include uh, the hundreds of thousands of Armenians uh, who were uh, driven from Baku and Sumgait and Gidobabad and elsewhere within Azerbaijan. That would require a sea change in Azerbaijan's attitude toward Armenians, one that uh, is not very likely given how terribly uh, the Aliyev government and others in, in, in the leadership of Azerbaijan have poisoned their population, including school children. Uh, they have demonized Armenians in the extreme. Uh, they have said publicly that Yerevan itself is Azerbaijani land, that, that the, the Republic of Armenia needs to be uh, uh, you know, broken down and restored uh, to the Azerbaijan Republic. They speak of um, uh, Armenians in, in the most inhuman terms, and dehumanizing terms. They uh, don't allow, for example, even ethnic uh, Armenians who are, who are U.S. citizens from traveling to, to Azerbaijan. It's very rare that you have an ethnic prohibition on travel. Azerbaijan is one of the very few countries that does that. Uh, there's a whole range of other ways that Azerbaijan has demonized Armenians. And uh, when we reach the point that Azerbaijan has uh, reversed course in a very profound way, starting in the schools and going up right up to the president uh, of the republic. When they have begun uh, to, to, to rehabilitate themselves and move into a post-demonization uh, phase regarding Armenians, then we can talk about people returning home because that would be the day um, when it would be reasonable to talk about, well, could an Armenian return to Baku? Could an Armenian return to Sumgai? Um It's not even uh, on the table today because uh, their security, uh, their, their lives would be in great danger. So when we reach the point where Azerbaijan is reverse course on its demonization of Armenians, then we can have a comprehensive discussion about you know, who gets to go back. And we want, obviously, uh, people to be, have the right uh, to, to, to live and, and grow in, in, the, in the homes of their ancestors. Uh, that's uh, an important element uh, of a, of a long-term peace, but, but let's, be, let's be fair and let's be honest. Let's be, let's be very straightforward here. Azerbaijan has poisoned that well, and we need to work hard uh, to, to reverse that. Which brings us here to uh, uh, point number six in this uh, recycled package of, uh, of proposals. And it says here, uh, a settlement must include international security guarantees that would include a peacekeeping operation. There is no scenario in which peace can be assured without a well-designed peacekeeping operation that enjoys the confidence of all sides. Um, I have a lot to say about this. I'll, I'll try to keep it a little brief. Um, as Armenians, uh, we know our history. And we know what promises are worth. We know, for example, in the genocide era, uh, there were promises from here in Washington regarding a mandate and Wilsonian Armenia and all sorts of protections and, and, and proposals that would you know, integrate uh, uh, an independent Armenian Republic into the family of nations. We know where that ended up. Uh, others, including the British and the French, made their promises, all of which evaporated. Uh, the Russians, for their part, you know, played uh, their role in the region and then retreated from it in, in ways that uh, 
uh, ran counter to their earlier commitments. So we have a very keen sense of how much value to place on, uh, on foreign promises, uh, number one. Uh, number two, uh, you know, we know that, that uh, it's, I guess uh, we know as a result of that, that we need to rely uh, much more upon ourselves than upon the commitments of others to our, our, our security. Uh, and third, uh, we at the ANCA took a, a very careful look at peacekeeping operations, and we came across uh, several studies, uh, including some by the United Nations. Now, this peacekeeping operation may not be a UN operation. It may be some hybrid or some uh, other uh, formulation uh, of peacekeepers, but uh, but we took a look at the UN peacekeeping as an example, as a benchmark, and found that, that the UN itself, now consider this, right? The UN itself, uh, in its critique of itself, which you would assume is going to be a little bit lighter, a little bit less tough than external criticisms, the UN itself, when it studied uh, the success of UN peacekeeping operations, specifically on the narrow question of what happens when UN peacekeepers see, observe, are in the presence of violence committed against the very citizens they are uh, obliged to protect, in what percentage of cases does the UN do anything to uh, prevent, prevent that violence or to protect those citizens? And the answer is about 20% of the time. That's an 80% failure rate as defined by the UN uh, regarding its own record. So I'm going to assume that the record's even worse. It might be you know, less than uh, a 20% success rate, a greater than an 80% failure rate. Uh, the, the history of the world, the UN and others, in protecting citizens, look at, look at, look at Serbia, look at Rwanda, look at Sudan, uh, all these stories of you know, uh, rock-solid promises being offered to civilian populations of, we will stand with you, we will protect you, we will come between you and those who wish you violence, those who are aiming uh, their weapons at you, we shall intercede and protect you. In almost every case, right, in, in four out of five cases, by the UN's own definition, own, own uh, findings, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And the, the citizens end up uh, the victims of the very same violence that would have been visited upon them had those promises never taken place, had those peacekeepers never been deployed. So for us, again, to accept these principles, uh, on this last one in particular, would require that we suspend our uh, our logical facilities, our ability to, to reason and come to thoughtful judgments about our future. If in every one of these six cases, we suspended our moral values, we suspended our intelligence, we suspended our sense of self-preservation, I guess in that fantasy world, which I'll, you know, I don't think any Armenians are in that world, but in, if we were in that world of no morality, no logic, no self-preservation, then I guess we could sit down and, and go over these seriously. But the fact of the matter is they don't deserve serious consideration. I spent considerable time here uh, going through them with you in, 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 in detail, because I think they, that as Armenians, as, as friends of Armenia around the world, we need to study this stuff very carefully, but not so carefully and not so seriously that we lose the ability to, to, to see um, uh, you know, baloney, uh, to put it kindly, uh, when we see it, right? Uh, the, the emperor has no clothes. This is a bad deal. It's been recycled uh, continuously. It is as bad now as it was before. In fact, in some ways, it's even worse. Uh, the, the, there are prospects for real peace. Uh, they're based on democracy. They're based on self-determination. They're based on uh, values that we all hold uh, re regarding uh, liberty. Uh, there are prospects for peace. There are ways to resolve these issues. There are ways that we can reach a long-term settlement that addresses the needs of all the citizens of the regions. But the Madrid principles are not that plan. Uh, I hope that today I was able to share some of that with you in a way that makes uh, sense. Uh, there'll obviously be much more to come, uh, but for uh, the time being, I'm going to sign off uh, from Yerevan, and thank you all. Please stay tuned to the NCA.